so I'm going to introduce the first panelist, Robert McCullough, who is an international energy expert and has 30 years of experience in the field. Um, he's based in Portland, Oregon. Um, he has come up many times uh, into this province in the last few months. I'm actually wondering how you feel about being, that maybe you're going to move here because you've been here so often, um, and for which we appreciate uh, the great work that you've done for us. Um, and um, Robert is known for, in particular for many things in terms of his expertise, but particularly for exposing uh, Enron's role in the California energy crisis. He um, has a strong international reputation, and we welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to be the most boring speaker tonight. I will note that I grew up in Chicago, and I am a, unfortunately, somewhat decrepit Irish peasant, so I respect the invitation greatly. I've worked for many indigenous peoples, corporations, governments. But the part that I'm dealing with today is simply the law of the land. Let me make this very, very straightforward. Regulation and accounting is set by rules adopted both in Canada and the United States. They are not in dispute. The government does not make rates. They do not make accounting treatment. Those are set out in the law. They have not followed the law. And I've talked this over with accounting experts, other people in the field. I apologize for being boring today, but in fact, we're getting down and dirty into the real life of how you do these calculations for projects of this sort. We'll see if I hit the right button. I'm not hitting the right button. Okay, so here's the bottom line. Three months ago, it was an $8.7 billion project. Today, it's a $10.7 billion project. Premier Horgan got the numbers wrong right at the outset. It's $2 billion, not $1 billion. We have already paid $2.4 billion. I love this theory that suddenly that money appears to be paid if he makes a decision or not. It's been financed. It's been spent. The interest is due. Nothing we are going to do here or in the government will change one dollar of that. Those are sunk costs. The Nobel Prize winner has written books on this issue. It is not in discussion. We have an option of spending $8.3 billion for the dam or much less than half of that for alternative resources. Why are they so cheap? It's because our technology has changed. This is a 40-year-old project. It was planned by our grandparents. It is no longer pertinent to our energy future. In addition, we... In addition, we need to reclaim the area. And we have heard that it will cost $1.8 billion. I've been advised by council to make no jokes, but the simple fact is we are talking about the Peace River Disneyland here. We're not talking about replanting the trees. We're talking about a massive project with very little economic foundations to replant those trees for $1.8 billion. The bottom line is we can have $3 billion for schools, dams, health care, if we just stop the project. So what did Attorney General E.B. say? First, it'll require an immediate 12% increase. I'm sorry, Attorney General, you should know better, but the fact is, rates are governed by the British Columbia Utility Commission. This is a matter of law and accounting. If they go beyond the BCUC, then the accounting community will, in fact, question the accounting statements of the province of British Columbia. Ignoring the rules raises the ratings on the bonds. Following the rules lowers the ratings on the bonds. 
Nothing the Premier or the Attorney General can do can legally change those rates. Second, an immediate three to four billion dollar write down. Well, the fact is, as I said, 2.4 is spent and the 1.8 is hypothetical. Next, it'll cost 120 million in new annual debt service. Again, the bonds have been sold. The interest rates are there. The interest payments are there. There is no one holding the bonds waiting for their decision. All of that money has to be financed. It's real money. It has to be spent, and you are borrowing it. And that interest will be paid, regardless of their decision. And finally, this may cause a bond down rating. Though most of you will never have read a bond rating document, it's interesting that the most recent bond rating documents all have a gently stated reproof of the provincial government. That's because in the law of the land, the bond raters do not drive decisions, they report events. And trying to draw them into a political debate is not acceptable. And so when you read these bond ratings, you'll notice there's been a gentle slap to the province. By the way, a gentle slap from a bond rating agency like Moody's is a pretty heady slap in the real world. There we go. Uh, okay, the first thing is, is there actually someone holding this debt that we haven't met yet? The answer is no. BC Hydro is a very thin crown corporation. It does not have independent bonds. It does not have independent finances. It is a direct subsidiary of the government. So there is no one else in the room. That $10.7 billion is directly a provincial debt. Second, accounting rules trump regulatory rules. That, unfortunately, is simply wrong. The fact is, the BCUC sets the rules. They have the commitment to it. They understand the rules, and we'll see a quote in a moment on how they treat this. So the fact is, both U.S. and Canadian utilities have canceled many projects over the years. This is not the first project that has been found inappropriate after it started. We have seen no evidence of an immediate rate increase. When the nuclear plant was canceled in Quebec, the rates did not go up the next morning. The fact is that is not consistent with accounting and regulatory rules across North America. Well, I love this argument about the uh, rate increase. For those of you in the industry, a rate increase requires a filing with the regulatory commission by the utility, it is a long and lengthy process. It takes a year. If the Premier or the Attorney General ordered a rate increase with an order in council, we would simply have left regulatory and accounting practice for the rest of the continent. This would downrate the province. This would be a statement that the province had left the accounting practices used elsewhere. It's not going to happen. And of course, the rating agencies I just approached, the rating agencies deal with real life facts, not hypotheses. So who is financing Site C? Well, we can just took, look to Moody's most recent decision, which was last week. And they said, the province issues debt on behalf of BC Hydro, the wholly owned electric utility company of British Columbia. So if you don't believe me, at least you can believe Wall Street. <laughs> it's simply incorrect. Prudency. For the last hundred years, we've had a set of prudency rules. Now, you're all used to prudency rules. If you go to the bank and you say, I would like a Ferrari. We all would love to have a Ferrari, an electric Ferrari. <laughs> and the banker says, I'm sorry, Mr. McCullough, that's very prudent. You can't afford a $400,000 car. And you say, well, 
I want to go ahead anyway. And he just says, no, thank you, come back when you want to buy a Volvo. Okay, that's fine. That is the basic standard of law for the U.S. and Canada. You have to have a prudency review. It is unlikely that this entire project will turn out to be prudent, but that review will not occur until the project is canceled or if it's completed. That's the timing of that prudency review. The BC Utility Commission has said very clearly that they are not ruling on prudency until they get that filing. And they went further by saying that once they get those filings, then they will go through a very detailed analysis. So this entire speech about the change in rates, the immediacy, absolutely contracts, contradicts what the BCUC simply said a month or so ago. This is not in debate. Here is their statement on prudency. I am not going to drive you crazy by trying to read two paragraphs, but let me characterize it very simply. Bring it to us later and we will tell you if it's prudent. At the moment, we know what the BCUC decided in their final report. Their final report found that the alternatives were less expensive and less risky and that there was no major rate impact. So we have a pretty good idea what that prudency review will look like. Just for the sake of argument, here is the schedule I would give the Attorney General if he had joined us today. If we terminate, we would be filing for the termination case. Approximately a year from now, we'd be having some rate response, and we would have a appropriate set of reserve accounts set in place. Uh, he said it's clear that those reserve accounts would be immediate, 10 years. The BCUC said, we have not made up our mind on that. We are using 10, 30, and 70 years for their report. So if we complete, we move on to 2025, then we have the prudency report. Then we will be sitting in a different forum. We'll be downtown with the big businesses screaming that this project was never prudent because it wasn't prudent. And then, in fact, some future government will have the concerns about write-downs. And even so, those decisions will not occur before 2026. Ratings. BC Hydro doesn't have a rating. They don't have bonds. They are not an economically responsible individual firm in this context. So what we see in each one of the ratings is a comment saying we're concerned about the rapid run up in debt. They're worried about what you're borrowing. They don't actually worry about what you're spending it on. In fact, they prefer a windmill because it costs much, much less. They don't care if you build a house and then found, after the foundation was poured, that there was a better house you should be building and you stopped the first house and started the second so long as the new house is cheaper than the old house. They want you to borrow less. The economists, like myself, want you to borrow less. We want a far less impact on the province. The rating agencies are very explicit on this. Again, here is the quote from Moody's. I won't force you to listen to me. But they basically said, we're worried about this $10.7 billion investment. Now, this is the exact opposite of what the Attorney General said. Now, I put this forward just to give you a comment of how unique this is. When we started the regulatory case at the BCUC in August, they had completed 24% of the dam. Today, they have spent another $300 million, but the cost of the dam has gone up $2 billion. So they've lost, what's the right word? 
They're falling off their own treadmill. That's what they're doing. <laughs> so the dam is less complete in January than it was in August. Now, this is exactly what has been happening in Manitoba and Newfoundland. Over-optimistic estimates tend to come to roost. And unfortunately, the full question of how much the dam will cost depends on God. Because God built that river valley. And the fact that they assumed that that river valley's shoulder hillside would be more stable than it is, is simply a question that we'll find out later. And they are still very concerned about that. The materials we've received in the course of the West Moberly litigation indicate that is an ongoing concern at BC Hydro. So let me just walk through the bottom line here. It's very simple. And then I apologize for being the most boring person today. Cancellation will cause a 12% rate increase. That's simply wrong. It's not an immediate rate increase. We don't know where the 12% came from. It contradicts the BCUC calculations. That is simply an assumption. It's not a fact. False. It will not trigger a $3 to $4 billion write-down. Most of that money is already spent. There is nothing we can do about that. That's a sunk cost. The fact is that the people who matter, the people who lend money to the province, would be overwhelmingly happy if we didn't go ahead to borrow the next eight to nine billion dollars. False. An immediate 125 million to 150 million a year interest payments. As I've said again and again, the bonds are sold. You're going to pay the interest. You borrowed the money. You spent it. And I'm speaking of you. It's the people in this room who are paying those bills. Nothing gets triggered by the Premier's decision. And finally, false. Nowhere in any of the bond discovery documents that I have been through, and I've been through them with a fine-tooth comb, do they say, we really love Site C. Let's go forward with this. It's great for bond ratings. They say the exact opposite. They say we are concerned about rising debt levels. And they would much prefer that we chose the most economic choice. I've spoken more than my invitation. I apologize to the more interesting people to come. But let me close with one last comment. There are mistakes so evocative that we as a society make them again and again. And this is one of them. It is inappropriate for the Premier to say, the previous premiers did not do it right, but now I am committed. That's not the right answer. The right answer is to look at the entire issue from the bottom up. We did that at the BCUC. BC Hydro lost that proceeding and then recovered their influence at the bitter end. And the fact is, as much as as attractive as John Horgan is and his cabinet, and I've met them, I was invited to talk to them on this issue, they should have started with a clean sheet of paper and canceled the project. I think we have to let some more of those uh, that Irish humor come out because uh, that was very, I think I learned a lot listening to you and I know that this is not easy. Um, this is not the way we talk a lot when we uh, get together as people who are in social movements. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk about um, bond rating agencies and how to, how to talk about accounting procedures. So part of our desire here is to equip you for having those conversations because otherwise we feel bamboozled and we're not able to respond. Um, I just want to note that we, uh, assuming we stay enough in time, there will be a question period afterwards for those of you who have questions. So I'm now going to introduce Harry Swain, who's the former chair of the Joint Review Panel, uh, which was, um, I believe, 2014. Is that right, Harry? Um, and that was um, uh, 
did a, a fairly detailed analysis and was not, they were not um, mandated to actually take a position on Site C. They certainly created the groundwork for a lot of what I think Harry's gonna talk about now. Um, I want to note that Harry is one of these people who probably you didn't know what you were getting yourself into when this discussion opened up uh, in the way that it did in the last year. But every few months, Harry would be there with uh, not only either a press conference or an op-ed piece or some way of saying, um, I have a different view here, and I'm really, I, we're all really appreciate, appreciative of the courage and the energy that you've put into this, Harry. So welcome to you, Harry Swain. Thank you. Um, I started out a couple of days ago with some really snazzy slides, almost as good as Robert's. Uh, uh, the, uh, some lawyers looked at them and said, oh no, nothing humorous, please. Uh, my principal task at the moment is assisting Chief Wilson and Chief Linnett with an affidavit for their upcoming court case. And, uh, and so their counsel had the view that I should not give too many hostages to fortune in a public speech and particularly anything written down. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be very dull. <laughs> this is about accounting after all. Um, I should also say that I agree with at least 97% of what Robert just said, so I really could go home now and we'd be fine. <laughs> the uh, most succinct explanation for the decision to go ahead with Site C was uh, provided by the Honorable David Eby, I think, in a letter to his constituents in December. Uh, some of the statements in that thing are true. Mr. Eby said that the previous government proposed billions in public spending for power demand that is at best uncertain. In this, he follows the analysis of most subjective observers. He observed that the BCUC report commissioned by his government, concluded that terminating Site C and implementing a portfolio of alternative generation technologies would have comparable public and ratepayer costs to continuing with the Site C project. That's also true, because that's what BCUC said. The BCUC did not have advantage, the advantage of the latest information, uh, such as this month's announcement that the medium of 42 bids for 42,000 megawatts of wind power, I mean, that's more than half of what BC produces, uh, for Colorado was for US $18.10 a megawatt hour. Uh, this is, compare that with the 125 or and growing cost of uh, Site C. The wind potential of BC is at least as good as Colorado's, uh, which received this bid. And by the way, that, those, were, uh, those were tendered bids. They were available to be picked up. They're not pie in the sky. These are private companies who are proposing to build this stuff uh, for those prices and make a profit while doing it and pay taxes while they're doing it. The median bid for uh, eight bids of wind with battery storage. Remember that people always like to talk about, well, you can't. BC Hydro likes to say, you can't use wind because it's intermittent. Well, in Colorado, they got eight bids for wind plus battery storage, and the median price was $21 a megawatt hour. Fact is that the cost of alternatives has been plunging in recent years. There's a huge shift going on in utilities all over North America. Demand is flat or declining. Uh, that statement may be before bitcoins, but um, it has been recently true. But the, and while the cost of renewables has been falling dramatically. In BC, we have had essentially flat power demand since 2005, maybe a little before then. There is a real question about whether we will need power at all, at least for several decades. And the reasons for that have been set out in... Uh, submissions made to the Utility Commission inquiry dealing with the effect of 
rising prices on demand. The higher you jack up the price, the less people are going to consume. Um, it's for, for people who prefer engineering to, to uh, economics, think of LED bulbs. Um, I'm told that the lighting cost of uh, buildings in North America tends to be on the order of 20 or 22 percent of all the electricity consumed. And that can go down by 90 percent by a general shift to LED lighting. So the real question is whether we'll need the power at all, at least for several decades. BC hydro forecasting has been absolutely demonstrably awful. Those of you who have seen the Deloitte report that was done for the Utilities Commission, or the excellent report done by the UBC program on water governance, will have seen their detailed exposition of how consistently, year after year, back to 1964, hydro has overestimated demand. 77% of their forecasts have called for more power than in the event was actually needed. Now the government asked its officials in the Ministry of Finance uh, what it all meant. These officials provided unambiguous advice that while the net costs of the termination and continuation scenarios were broadly similar, the accounting treatment of the two models was dramatically different. Mr. Eby said, we were told that if we abandoned the Site C project, three to four billion would have to be recovered from today's BC hydro ratepayers, or government would incur an immediate breakdown of three to four billion dollars. Public financing would mean 120 to 150 million in new annual debt service charges, effective immediately. Well, I agree with everything Robert has said about the way these decisions are made. They are not made by cabinets. They are made by utility commissions after lengthy, painstaking, infinitely boring hearings and analysis. They take a long time. Leaving, and again quoting Mr. Eby, leaving the four billion charge and debt with hydro was no better. This approach would result in an acute risk that all of hydro's debt would no longer be considered commercial by bond raiders, or prudent, I suppose. Well, I'm sure Mr. Eby's a fine lawyer, but he's a lousy accountant. I note, by the way, that this advice came from the same officials who wrote the very snarky letter to BCUC um, uh, after the report was delivering, asking had they done this, had they done that, and so on and so forth, and demonstrating in the process that they hadn't read the report. These officials have a long history of strong commitment to Site C. Well, the sunk costs have already been spent. Um, the money has been borrowed on your tab. Uh, the interest is being paid on the first 2.4 billion, uh, rising at a couple hundred million a month. These costs are gone. Uh, uh, and you know, the money is in the hands of the contractors. These costs and the exaggerated costs of uh, termination arguably belong to the owners of BC Hydro, who so imprudently allowed them to be incurred. Having them financed by ratepayers over 70 years, uh, probably BC Hydro's preferred solution, uh, is an unjust burden on our grandchildren to say nothing of the deadweight anchor that is added to the cost of power in BC. And by the way, I share the, in an odd way, the government's concern about the cost of power. We had in this province and in Manitoba and Quebec a huge national competitive advantage. Our power was real cheap and it helped develop a lot of industry in this country. If we let it get much more expensive, we will start paying the cost in terms of industries that will find these, uh, the added price uh, a burden that is not tolerable. I note that a few years ago we had a dozen or 13 pulp mills in British Columbia. There are four left. 
they're in trouble because international commodity prices do not favor newsprint these days, uh, because the Americans are being beastly as they frequently are. Sorry, Robert, that's, that's, that's those other Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, but it's also because 20 to 25 percent of the variable cost of a pulp mill is electrical power. And if that goes up, in order to pave off the 20 odd billion in debt that BC Hydro now has, plus another 10 or 12 uh, for an unnecessary dam, um, if that's left with the ratepayers, it won't be just us who are hit, and it won't be just poor people who suffer energy poverty. It will be those well-paid, unionized folks who work in our remaining pulp and paper mills. I, I sometimes wonder where the, where the government's head was on this. Well, what would normally happen would be that, uh, 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 well, let me just say the obvious. Mr. Eby's advisors have, have got the, the case all wrong. Um, unless, of course, he has in mind shifting the debt straight onto the government books right away, which as the Minister of Finance he could well do, uh, or as, as a member of a cabinet that includes the Minister of Finance, Carol Jane, James. The stranded asset problem is a perfectly normal one in, in the utility world. Regulators have developed all kinds of good judgment ways of dealing with it. What would normally happen is that if BC Hydro, like PG&E or Duke Power or anybody else were faced with an unproductive or stranded asset, it would make a proposal to the BC Utilities Commission about how to handle it. Uh, doubtless BC Hydro would consult its shareholder before doing so. It would then be up to the Commission, after deliberations, after public hearings, to decide how much of the charge should go to ratepayers and how much to taxpayers and how much to British Columbians of the future and how much to those who elected the government that made the mistake in the first place. That's us. The commission would be expected to take all considerations into account and make a decision that contained livable compromises. This is normal procedure. For investor-owned utilities in the US, for example, there is usually a sharing of the cost between shareholders and ratepayers. Uh, and the terms of the payment is, are typically as brief as can be afforded. No one wants to burden the future un unnecessarily, but equally, it is a legitimate use of deferral accounts to smooth payments over a small number of years. Rating agencies expect this and will be quite unfussed by a conclusion reached in this sensible way. In any case, they don't make a distinction between ratepayer-supported and taxpayer-supported debt, especially when the former is unconditionally guaranteed by the latter. Even if we accepted that terminating Site C would add 150 million a year to current obligations, this would be less than the revenue foregone by this government for a single bridge. It would not materially affect spending plans. The scare words about, oh, we're just going to have to shut down our schools and hospitals is just horse feathers. So the bottom line, Site C is still a financial albatross. Accounting theology cannot hide that. The piper must be paid. But allowing accountants or civil servants to dictate public policy choices is folly. The real question is simply whether we should spend another $8 billion to buy an asset worth a fraction of that sum and thus really put a crimp in future spending opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. I really like that line, we shouldn't allow civil servants to dictate policy. Um, although, of course, it's the interaction between the civil servants and other forces that end up determining what the government is going to say. Um, I should have also mentioned when I introduced you, Harry, that he was a, uh, is or was a former um, uh, federal deputy minister of industry and Indian affairs, or of Indian affairs and later of industry, um, and uh, that um, he was also just a 
pump up your credentials a little bit, the director of the Hambro Merchant Bank. So Harry has a lot of experience in a lot of different areas. Um, now I would uh, like to uh, introduce our third panelist, Seth Klein, who is the BC director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. In the formal uh, description here, it's a public policy research instituted to, committed to social, economic and environmental justice. And that is so true about the CCPA. Um, and I remember uh, meeting Seth about 20 plus years ago. Um, both of us very much um, social justice activists when he was starting the CCPA at, here in British Columbia. And it's been a, not only a tremendous success as an organization, but I, I think plays an absolutely invaluable role in keeping us grounded in good research, good analysis, good policy, and... <laughs> and, and getting those voices into the media. So Seth, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> Thank you. You're Appreciation of the work of a bunch of policy nerds is gratefully acknowledged and a little bit weird. Um, so uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to be sharing the stage with such a distinguished panel. These folk, these gentlemen are much more expert in, in energy and utility economics than I am and also an honor to be here with, with the chiefs from, from Treaty 8 territory. And I want to acknowledge that we're, we're here on the territory of the, the Songhees and Esquimalt First People. Um, so there's no question that uh, last month's decision uh, to, was a difficult one and that the previous government had left this government with a no-win poison pill. I don't envy them. And uh, a number of the people who made the decision are people who I consider my friends. Um, and yet, I think they have made a terrible mistake. Uh, and my motivation in... Uh, I, I wrote this piece that some of you will have seen a couple of weeks ago uh, and that I'm riffing off of right now. And my motivation in writing it was simply that um, when I hear these economic justifications that I think uh, uh, have, no, have no merit, I just, I just can't let it stand. I just have this like BS uh, alarm thing that motivates much of my writing. It's a curse, really. Um, and, uh, but also, I think, I think unpacking the decision matters. Uh, for what it has to tell us about who gets listened to, whose expertise wields authority, what considerations win the day, and mostly so that we consider how as progressives we can shake up the framework by which future decisions are made. Um, I just have to point this over there. Oh wait, am I holding it upside down? All right. <laughs> Oh, okay, so we've been on the record at CCPA for some years with critiques of, of Site C, much of uh, stuff that's been written by, by our Ben Parfit, who is here. Um, one of the projects we have at the CCPA that I'm most excited about is a partnership with the Union of BC Indian Chiefs that we started before the last election without realizing how timely it would be, in which we are seeking to answer the question, what would it look like to make BC's laws and policies compliant with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And uh, this, this decision is so clearly anathema to that. Um, and also our senior economist, Mark Lee, made it one of those submissions to the BCUC and gave testimony, uh, making, among those, making the case that, uh, first of all, BC Hydro's forecast left a great deal to be desired, uh, and that the uh, the electricity from Site C wasn't ne needed even as we take full action on climate and electrify our homes and our cars. Indeed, our contention for many years has been that what's truly driving the push for Site C was the natural gas industry's demand for electricity, both for fracking operations and down the road, they hope to electrify the process of, of liquefying that gas, meaning it is primarily about producing a clean, energy in the service of a dirty fossil fuel, and it still might be. Um, now granted, the, uh, the prospect of spending a bunch of money and having nothing to show for it hurts, although the notion that leaving the valley in peace doesn't represent an asset is telling. Um, this question, though, of who holds the debt, I do think matters. Given the decision to green light, that, that the decision to green light Site C 
was politically driven by the previous government, my view is that the costs of termination should not have been borne by BC Hydro, but rather by the provincial government as a whole. Now, some might say that makes no difference. The cost of that interest, whether it's ratepayers or taxpayers, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. I think it does make a difference, mainly uh, for a reason that, that Harry was just alluding to, which is that we know that hydro rates are regressive. Lower income people pay a higher share as a, as, as a share of their household income, whereas when we leave it with the province, that debt is serviced through the overall tax base, which is mildly progressive. Uh, and so that we should, we should choose that option. And relieving BC Hydro of the cost of termination could have been done by either transferring the sunk costs and, uh, directly onto the provincial government's debt, or if the government didn't want to assume that debt from BC Hydro, it could simply have agreed to annually transfer the interest costs uh, uh, to BC Hydro as restitution for this politically imposed cost with a little annual apology letter. Um, <laughs> So one of the key questions then before us is that would taking on, and let's put a, let's just take the government at their word around the overall cost of that debt somewhere between three and four billion, would it have threatened the government's agenda? Would it have squeezed out all the good things that they wanted to do? Uh, no. Um, so even again, if you, if, you, if you took the high end maximum interest costs, of $150 million a year. Now, notably, it's pretty clear that the government actually accepted Robert's argument when he went to cabinet uh, that they would be able to amortize the cost because they, they, they were only talking about the interest costs, which maxed out at $150 million a year. Now, $150 million a year is nothing to sneeze at, of course, but it's less than the current surplus. For a little further context, it's 0.3% of BC's annual budget which is to say a rounding error. Contrast that with the decision in the mini budget in September to cut MSP premiums by 50%. Now I'm all for getting rid of MSP premiums, they're regressive, but the government didn't just cut that, they walked away from the revenues of about $1.2 billion, not once, every year, without seemingly blinking an eye. Or as the Greens have pointed out, you can contrast it with the portmanteau decision, which is an interesting one because the costs are almost identical in terms of the cost of the debt transfer and the annual foregone toll amount of, is also about $150 million a year. And yet the, the September mini-budget estimated the impact of that decision on BC's debt to GDP ratio to be 1.2 percentage points. Again, uh, not much. Um, just to give you a little further background on this, this is, all right, now it's too small for most of you to see, but this is some background on BC's debt. And in the, the second column in gray is the current year. Total BC debt, including from the crowns, which is almost all BC Hydro, is about $66 billion. Sounds like a lot of money, it's kind of meaningless. What matters are the numbers closer to the bottom, which is how much is that debt relative to our annual income or relative to our GDP? which is 16.2%, or even if you included BC Hydro's debt, not just this debt we're talking about today, all of it, like 20 billion, um, is still only 24%. Uh, percent. Or if you look at the very bottom, the annual servicing of that debt, meaning for every dollar of revenue the province collects, how many cents do they have to spend servicing the debt? Three and a half cents. Or even if you include BC Hydro's debt, 3.8 cents. This is all small. It's small by historic standards. It's small relative to other provinces. Um, uh, and the credit rating agencies know this. And this chart here looks at BC's debt relative to the other provinces. We're the third lowest, so Alberta and Saskatchewan are less. All the other province, the next province up is Manitoba. So even if you included all BC Hydro's debt, BC's debt to GDP ratio would still be remarkably lower than the next province, Manitoba. Um, the next question was, would taking on that kind of debt threaten BC's credit rating? Um, really not likely. Um, first of all, uh, for the reasons I just said, BC's debt situation is comparatively pretty healthy, and even the credit rating agencies note that we have what's called fiscal flexibility 
which means we actually have a lot of options for raising revenues. Secondly, this is an interesting point that was actually drawn to my attention by the treasurer of BCGU. BC's debt is secured against $130 billion in the BC Investment Management Corporation's funds for public pensions. So that amount is basically double our total debt, including BC Hydro. And this argument that, that Harry also spoke to that, that Dave Eby made, which was this fear that, it, that if we did this, Hydro's debt wouldn't be considered commercial and it would be considered taxpayer supported, not, makes no sense. The BC government in its budget decides what's taxpayer supported and non-taxpayer supported. They have to pass muster with the Auditor General, but the credit rating agencies don't get a say on that. They just get to give an opinion. Um, and this, I took this from Ken Boone's recent newsletter, arguably uh, the debt rating agencies may have rewarded us for this decision, for showing prudence and avoiding these kinds of multi-billion dollar cost overruns. And so just last week, Moody's reaffirmed BC's AAA credit rating, uh, and off, but, but flagged a little concern about the cost of Site C. Um, and that leather quote is from Alex Hemingway in our office. All right, the next question. These slides are advancing a little fast for me. Um, so even if a downgrade had occurred, would BC face significantly higher interest case? Again, there's frequently a lot of fear mongering about this, uh, and that result should not be assumed. Uh, bond markets don't respond slavishly to credit rating agencies. But consider this. The credit ratings of Canadian provinces range from a high of BC's AAA to a low of PEI's single A. In practice, what that means is that the interest we have to pay on our long-term bonds ranges from a low in BC of 3.1% to a high in Atlantic Canada of 3.5%, which is to say not a big difference. And a couple of economists recently looked at the question of, well, what does the evidence say about the impact on interest rates of a one-notch downgrade from Standard & Poor's and found it to be 0.04%, which is to say, not very much. Um, so I have this concern about letting others call the tune. You know, that even when progressive governments get elected, neoliberal mindsets die hard. They persist. And they continue to define the scope of what's seen as politically possible and acceptable. And there's this presumption that we can't raise taxes beyond modest changes without threatening loss of investment. And we still bestow far too much authority to finance officials and accountants, the same people giving the same advice. So we saw these arguments that we just looked at that, that we heard from a number of the MLAs, which is that they sent the BCUC report to uh, their finance officials and they were told that the costs were actually equivalent, but that the accounting treatment of the choices would be different. Effectively, the government has said that accounting practices as interpreted by finance ministry officials, trumped good policy and UNDRIP. It raises for me this fundamental question of who is in charge here. The government we elected to make choices in partnerships with First Nations or New York bond rating agencies. The problem, I fear, is that the full scope of options gets lost at the cabinet table. If your deputy minister, for example, sounds the debt or credit rating alarm, few politicians feel comfortable pushing back. Or if the government is spooked by a credit rating downgrade threat, they fear that reaction. It is a curse of modern social democratic governments that on economic matters especially, they are inclined to let other people tell them what is and is not allowed. And that dynamic plagues otherwise progressive people who lack confidence in economics, and it is heightened when the civil service, civil, senior civil servants remain in place, the same people giving the same advice. So where do we go now? In the end, this decision was clearly a political one based primarily on fear, I think, not an economic one. And only time will tell whether it was a strategically correct one or a costly mistake. But I think we need to feel emboldened and we need our government to be emboldened to make economic decisions based not on fear, that reject austerity thinking and push back on the bond rating agencies. We need to be thinking creatively about marshalling alternative sources of investment capital, if we're actually worried about that, like the pension funds I just mentioned. We need to embed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in BC law so that something like this can never happen again.
And finally, we need a mechanism to better hear from those outside government with creative solutions and alternative perspectives. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm just going to give these cards to these wonderful panelists before I forget, just a sec. Thank you so much. So um, uh, a lot there, pretty heady stuff, eh? Um, good stuff, so, but just take a minute and just shake it out a bit, like however you need to, shake your hands or you know, move your body or whatever, but you've been sitting for a while and I need to do that. Yes, yeah, stand up or just some little bit of energy in the room. Okay, so um, this is what's gonna happen for the next little bit, we have about 20 to 25 minutes for questions and or comments um, in relation to this panel. Um, and then we're going to take a break. So it's not break time, although of course everybody should feel free to use the washrooms or whatever when they need to. And then we're gonna take a break um, and I'm gonna make a few announcements before we take the break and then we come back for the second panel. So before um, we take questions, there's a, um, a a uh, guideline uh, that I'm going to ask you to all observe in all of our plenary um, moments. The first is to um, uh, deal with one another in as open-hearted a way as we can because we are all in this together and so um, uh, dial down the judgment, open up the curiosity and connecting with one another. Secondly, brevity to share the space with others. So. Um, I'm going to ask you to keep your comments or your questions, however you want to see, see them, to one and a half minutes to um, allow maximum numbers. And um, one of the um, participants in this um, summit, Brenda Dragon, who you will meet tonight, um, she suggested you think about sharing the space when we have speaking time like this. Imagine it's a big feast. Take a little bit, and then when everybody's had some, you can take some more. So you go back. And thirdly, diversity. So I'm gonna ask you to pay attention to who's is who is speaking, who's lined up and where they're lined up and to make it different and to make equity a priority. And if those of you who are in the line do not do that, then I will actually change the order in the lines to ensure that marginalized voices um, are in the lineup. So um, please bear with me on this. I would prefer if you did it yourself rather than me doing it, all right? And so I'm noting right now that there's all men in this line and there's a man in this line and there's a couple of women. So you might wanna mix it up a bit, folks, okay? Um, so I'm going to start with this one over here, please. Guy. Thank you, um, my name is Guy Dornsey. I'm a panelist on the next panel coming up. It strikes to me the single conclusion I draw from your presentations is that the the Carol James and John Horgan and Cabinet have been seriously misled by their financial treasury officials. That, that allows some displacing of blame from them in person if that can be brought forward as a key thing. Is there any historical precedent for either a, a sort of strong public complaint or even a legal complaint directed to the finance officials rather than their permanent protectors, the finance Minister who's, I'll take the blame, I'll take the blame. How do we get directly to blame the financial officials and their old neoliberal assumptions and their prior commitment to site C? Okay, so um, Guy, are you uh, directing that to Seth and yeah, to? I think whichever three of them can answer that best. Yeah, I'm, not sure. uh, I'm gonna. In... Let them Seth? choose who answers that best. Take a few? You wanna take a few? Um, yeah, we could take a few, that's not a bad idea. So please, you guys pay attention. I think we'll take a couple of questions first. It's a good idea and see if they double up, okay? So, um, please. Well, maybe, uh, Ooh. Uh, oops, is that working? Maybe yeah. mine is sort of the same because the question I've had on my brain for the last time, is, uh, the last, this, this one in the first slide, David Evy saying, we've been advised. And it's like, well, who, by whom? And I'm getting hints from Seth and, I'm, and, and of course, Guy just said it. But I really want to know, David, you, we've been advised. By who, David? Okay. All right. 
Thank you. So maybe we'll just take these two because they're very um, they're very similar questions. Which is, you know, who is doing the advising and what does that mean? So uh, Harry and then Seth. Uh, Guy Dunsey asked whether there were uh, precedents for officials taking the fall. They are very few. Officials are pretty good at self-defense, as you know. But uh, there was at least one spectacular one about 30 years ago when uh, uh, Alan McEachan's budget in 1982, I think, or 81 or 82, uh, ran into a buzzsaw and the deputy minister was thrown under the bus. So there are, you know, one or two exceptions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Seth, would you like to? I can't answer the direct question of the, of the precedent. Um, but given a choice, as you say, between if when I see information that seems misleading to me, I, you know, given a choice between whether or not we are being directly misled or they are being directly misled, I, uh, and because some of them are my friends, I choose the latter. Um, uh, and I think whether or not there's a consequence for that, I think the more important question that I was trying to get at is, how do we change this up so this never happens again? How can we use this as a signal to say, you're getting inadequate advice from the circle where you're getting it, you need to somehow blow this thing up. Okay, thank you, sir. I, uh, a, a quick one, please, yes. I'm not gonna take the, all the panelists all the time, but yeah, for this one, okay, Robert? Manitoba 30 years ago had a similar situation. Eventually a judge was appointed to investigate and a number of people lost their jobs. There are mechanisms. I'm not a lawyer, but that worked in Manitoba. You might want to look it up. Thank you. Okay, yes, on this side. Hi, my name is uh, Tom Mitchell. Uh, a recent town hall on Salt Spring, Elizabeth May, pointed out that the Canadian construction uh, company, Acon, is uh, being taken over by a Chinese uh, state-owned company. Does that give any leverage to turn things around or stop anything? If, if you give us your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, thanks for that question. We had a number of people uh, when we were doing the quick survey beforehand wanting to know what that might mean. So I don't know if any of the panelists want to pick that one up. Did anybody else have a question relating to the Chinese? Um, Andrew might want to do it. Okay, uh, where is Andrew? Andrew, would you like to answer that one? <laughs> Pulling somebody, come, you, you want to come down to the mic, Andrew? Okay. Oh, so this is Andrew Nikoforic, famous journalist. Oh, Andrew, Andrew, you have to come down for the live streaming. Thank you. The short answer to this uh, question is that yes, this, this dramatically changes uh, a lot of things. And the story is basically this. Acon is the third largest construction firm in Canada. It's 140 years old. It built things like the CN Tower, the Halifax shipyards. Uh, last year it sold, was sold to a state-owned enterprise, which means that this company is a cartel that is run by the Communist Party of China. Uh, the China Communications Construction Company, one of the world's largest infrastructure builders, and a company that is notorious for its workplace and safety uh, violations, not to mention commercial fraud, which when you are banned by the World Bank for participating, uh, in contracts for seven years, I think that makes you notorious. Uh, so now this company, uh, which has bought Acon, um, is, and Acon is the preferred bidder, uh, uh, part of a partnership for the generating station and the spillway for Site C. Um, if this decision alone doesn't give the government pause, it gives them another way to back out of a very bad decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh,
Thank you, Andrew. And Andrew is on the next panel. Uh, and I will just say that if you don't know his writing, go to Tai. I would say on Site C, he is a relentless terrier and brilliant. So read his stuff. <laughs> Harry. Just uh, a footnote to that. Andrew's last point is, is the important one. There might be some political leverage in this. In point of fact, however, if uh, Hydro were instructed to throw Acon out the door at this point, they would then go to the next lowest bidder and the price would just go up some more. Ah, okay. Thank you, Harry. So I'm going to take a woman on this side and then come back to you, please. Very much. Sorry, I don't mean to be gender binary here. I'm just making assumptions, so um, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, you just made me really nervous, and I think I forgot my question. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to think of here is maybe more of a political solution to this problem. A decision has been made that I think we're all in disagreement with, and I suggest the majority of NDP and Green voters are very unhappy with. Our alternative seems to be Politically, what? What do we do? I, isn't there not some, uh, as I recall, political solution that uh, the, the people of British Columbia should simply say, we don't want this decision? I mean, isn't there some sort of referendum recall legislation existing in this province? Would that work in this situation? I don't know if anyone can answer that question. I want this decision stopped. So thank you, um, and I will, if the panelists want to speak to this, they can, but I just want you to know that in terms of the agenda, um, this evening before we break up, um, Steve Gray will be doing what we're calling um, uh, talking strategy round one. So he's going to make some suggestions, and then there'll be some more in the morning, and then we'll go into small groups. So we definitely are very concerned with where do we go and, and what are the options for changing this. So did any of the panelists want to pick up on that question? Okay. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to, and I'm coming back to you with this panel. I mean, thank, this is my Thank case. you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. My name is Joseph Roberts. I started Common Ground Magazine 35 years ago. David Eby is my MLA. I have visited David Eby with uh, Owen Finn, who, you, who was a partner in KPMG, and he has done his own financial analysis. It is not going to be 5, 6, 10.7. The 10.7 is this magic number to make you go into a trance and forget about reality. It's going to be more like he recalculated the financing costs, the transportation costs, $38 billion. Okay? They don't know what they're doing. We have an example of what just happened with the NDP government in Alberta. There's been institutional capture by the industries that run the show. The same thing's happening here. Institutional capture. And to quote another Irish person that wasn't able to make it today, George Carlin, there's too much bullshit and it's not good for anybody. So let's get to the reality that this, this is the wrong decision and we the people have to show leadership because our leaders are not working for the governed but the people that are their patrons. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm beside an E, father of sable fish, father just of all women. Asking people to say their names, please. I'm just reminding you, please say your name when you come up. I'm beside an E. Okay. Thank you. Uh, unresolved geotechnical issues. And. Uh, Muskrat Falls as a comparative. Is it conceivable that uh, Site C, which so many of us hope will never be seen in its entirety, stretch the entirety, uh, could it prove to be actually uh, impossible to build? And uh, how bad is uh, Muskrat Falls as a comparative? Okay. Um, does any of you want to take that on, Harry uh, or Robert? Well, I can. Okay. I've worked on both Muskrat Falls and on Site C. There are two facets here. The first is inexperience. We have four major hydroelectric projects in Canada going on at the moment. Three are with inexperienced utilities, one with an experienced utility. La Romaine in Quebec 
It's part of an ongoing construction program, whether or not we agree with it or not. It's on time and on budget, for real. The other three are significantly in trouble. And then the second facet is, what do you do when you are making a major excavation and you discover that you have ongoing geotechnical problems? The fact is, BC Hydro is very concerned with this. As part of the West Moberly litigation, we've been looking through recent documents. They are highly concerned that they will not be able to finish the left bank excavations. And they are watching it very carefully. But even more interestingly, the relocation of the highway, which has some of the same geotechnical risks, has now been postponed to the end of the project rather than the beginning of the project. Again, reflecting some very real concerns about the geology. And as I said before, these are not something that you know about when you start. It is very, very hard to guess that geology before you start the project. Thank you. And quickly from Harry, yes? In the case of uh, Muskrat Falls, uh, part of what would become the ultimate dam is a moraine that stretches across uh, part of the valley. Uh, this uh, moraine being above water and so on was easily observable by geotechnical engineers, uh, but it is apparently, uh, according to some, unsafe. And when the waters rise and the pressure on the uh, western face of that um, uh, moraine increases, there's a chance that it might um, break and the lower Churchill Valley be inundated in a couple of small towns swept away. Uh, this, of course, uh, has a limited financial impact on the good citizens of Newfoundland because our federal government, under the previous government, guaranteed $7 billion of what is now a 12.7 and rising cost. It was originally estimated at 6.2, and uh, you get to pay for that one, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Harry. And just want to note that we have another panel coming up where some of the impacts of these other dams will be raised, so there's an opportunity to talk then about those. Over to you, please. Hi. Um, my, name is, oh, my name is Candace Patiki, and um, my question is about energy demand. Um, I'm very concerned that we have this almost a rift <laughs> with the clean energy movement and the, and the folks who are worried about Site C and in the, um, in the days leading up to the decision, uh, we saw statements in the media about, well, you know, whatever happens with Site C, we're gonna need a lot more electricity. And this, uh, I just struggle with this because it seems like I'm being asked to hold two realities. Uh, and then when I inquire deeper into that, I'm told, well, it's because we don't have a real climate action plan. Uh, okay, if we're trying to meet our current demand, yeah, it's going to stay flat. But if we were really going to get serious about climate action, then somehow there's going to be this big spike in electrical need. I wonder if any of you on this panel can help me reconcile this question. Thank you, Candace. And I'm going to go to uh, Seth first on this one. Um, good question. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, Mark Lee in our office made a submission in the summer. Uh, it's up on our webpage, and I highly recommend it to you builds on work that we've done over a number of years and which he runs these numbers looking at demand uh, right up to like 2030 something um, and uh, we don't need the electricity um, is the short answer. He runs those scenarios sort of sort of status quo. He runs then when you factor in what would it look like with aggressive demand side management and conservation efforts it looks even better even when you layer into this uh, the need to uh, have more electricity for, as, we, as I said, as we electrify our homes and our cars and so on and really, really properly move on climate, uh, we don't need it, and, and particularly when set against the other alternatives and the prices where they are landing, as Harry, as Harry laid out, not only in a price comparison, but because of those being available where we need them, when we need them, uh, in, in a way that we can plan for without carrying anything like these multi-billion dollar risks. 
Thank you, Seth. I'm going to, um, maybe the panelists can hold it. They've got a few more, because we've got a lot of people lined up. We've only got five more minutes left for this plenary. So we're not going to be able to get to everybody, but there will be one after the next panel. So over to you, please. My name is Monica Nelson. I have a question in terms of renewable energy, just in general. Um, I'm on the, I have done some reading that apparently in Scotland, by 2020, they will be 100% renewable. 2020, two years from now. And I'm wondering if the model and the approach that they use is something that we could use to try and educate our unfortunate uh, Premier with. Okay, and that is also a great question. Some of this will also be raised in the next panel too, if you don't get all the answers you want. Can I be yes. uh, mm -hmm. an insurgent here and answer it? The technology has changed over the last 10 years. The cost of renewables has fallen dramatically. Uh, Harry mentioned the RFPs in both Alberta and Colorado. Now these are real, these are not planning studies. These are actual offers. We are not short on generation. Professor Jacquard and I have had this debate both at the cabinet and in the press. And the fact is he is wrong. <laughs> another when good Col Irish answer, when, right? <laughs> when Colorado gets 50,000 megawatts of potential wind projects, you are representing the fact that we are a continent. Oregon and Washington alone have 10 times as much wind as British Columbia. And as I pointed out to both the cabinet and to the BCUC, the wind does not stop at the Canadian border. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, yes, please. Hello, my name is Warren Bell. Uh, I'm a family physician and helped to found the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment about 25 years ago. My, my sector is beset by conflict of interest. In fact, we have a 20-year uh, history of studying conflict of interest and its influence on data and data outcomes and conclusions. And when a decision is made that is counter to rational thought, it usually implies that there is an inherent conflict underlying that apparently irrational decision. Mm -hmm. Because politics is all about power, my industry uh, in medicine, it's all about pharmaceutical companies wanting to sell products. In politics, it's all about retaining or uh, uh, losing power. So my question would be this, how could it not be that there is a conflict of interest guiding this decision. And I'd point to the fact that the largest single donation that came into the coffers of the NDP was about a $600,000 donation from the Steelworkers Union. And by the way, I'm not against unions, but I'm against conflict of interest. How could it not be that that plus another $300,000 from yet another union that might have had some interest not influence under the underlying the, the decision influenced the way the decision went against what is clearly a rational argument. <laughs> Thank you, Warren. Um, does anybody want to take that one on? Harry's ready. I'm not sure I can answer the question, but I, I offer an observation. Uh, of the 2,000 people who are said to be working on Site C, uh, about 400 were in Burnaby at Hydro headquarters. Of the rest, about half were from Alberta. And uh, of the 600 odd that were then left, those who were unionized tended very strongly to be members of the Christian Labor Association, all right? This is one reason why big labor was pretty quiet throughout the whole last several years of controversy about this. They didn't care very much. And I surmise neither did their uh, friends in the NDP. Now, there were exceptions. There, I, I met a former minister the other night who described himself proudly as a, as a brown shirt union man all the way and anything that was development was good. Uh, he was not particularly numerate, but he was vehement. <laughs> so I suspect there's a good bit of that going on. What I'm surprised about is the, is the, uh, is the, the, the last minute flurry of interest that came from the, the, sort of the, the, the ordinary the ordinary labor movement in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, Seth, I knew you'd want to weigh in on this well, one. Well, just as a mm -hmm. caution, I guess. I yeah. would not um, 
discount your point, but I would not presume it either. Um, yeah. It's a mixed bag. Uh, the labor movement is not of one opinion on this matter. The second largest donor to the NDP was the BCGU, and they're opposed to Site C. Um, so, uh, and I'm not, it's not clear to me that the steel workers are core beneficiaries. The building trade certainly saw themselves uh, as beneficiaries and, and were upfront about the fact that they supported this. Um, and one good thing that has happened in this fall session is a bill eliminating big money in politics. Uh, so if there, was any, if there was any feeling of indebtedness, it's not clear to me that that feeling exists going forward. Um, which is why I can't know. I, I've wrestled with this question. What truly motivated the decision? What were the determining factors? As I was implying in my piece, I, I actually think fear was a big piece of it. The fear of the bond rating agencies, the lack of confidence in these matters, the, 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 the sway of the, of the punditry and the press gallery, a whole bunch of things that, that wield far too much power than they, than, than they merit. Thank you, Beth. So, unfortunately, we have to stop. Um, so, there will be another plenary soon, um, but we're going to, in a minute, go to a break. So, before you leave, just a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is a little energizer for you. How many of you are from the north, broadly defined? Let's just see your hands. Yeah, great. And, and how many are you from the interior? You can double up if you want. And how many of you are from uh, the sort of greater Vancouver area? Woo. Yeah. And how many from southern Vancouver Island? Yeah. <laughs> Big numbers. And how many from northern Vancouver Island? Great. And how many from some category that's beyond this that I haven't mentioned? <laughs> so I just wanted to do that as a way of saying we're going to, in a minute, we're moving into a break, but we're going to make a few announcements. And we really encourage you to use the break and the dinner time to get to know one another, reach beyond your usual circles. So Janet has an announcement, and then I've got three announcements, and then we're going to break. I'll tell you more. I bet you everybody is feeling like they need a snack, right? Well, we have lots of great snacks. And we have gluten-free option for those that need it as well, and some fruit. And there is one coffee beverage snack station here. But there are two others. There's one through the door, straight into the room beyond that. And then there's one at the far end in the fellowship hall. So if you want a bit of a walk and some stretching, go to the far one. There's a men's washroom. I'm sorry I didn't say this earlier. There's a men's washroom at the back off the lobby at, at the narthex here uh, at the back of the church. And there's no women's washroom there, just a men's. There's also a woman's washroom to the right um, out these doors. And down the hall to your left, there's both a men's and women's washroom. And there are washrooms at the far end of the hall. That's that part of the snack oh part. Um, I also um, have a lost and found starting here. There's some reading glasses and a solitary glove. There is a lost and found basket on top of the piano in the um, room, the second room where the snack's happening. And I just wanted to say if anybody feels like they need to stand up and move around or go to the washrooms during these, please feel free to get up and do that. You need to look after yourselves. Thank okay, you. We're not done, not done almost. Thank you, Janet. A um, couple more announcements, but I can't resist this. Uh, David Suzuki just came up to me, and I want to honor the fact that David's here. Thank you. And uh, uh, he said to me, I asked you to put your hands up for where you come from. He said, well, how about asking how many of you voted either NDP or Green in the last election? Quite amazing. <laughs> there you go, David. We should have got a picture of that. Thank you. Okay, just a couple more announcements. Um, yes. Uh, yes, I was just gonna say about the tables here. So we have tables over here. Um, there is one for the Peace Valley uh, Landowner Association fundraising table um, because there's a considerable debt that they uh, need to 
not amortize, but get rid of right away <laughs> um, as a result of this struggle. So they're here, but also um, there's, I believe, uh, Fair Vote Canada, and then the um, uh, Matriarch Camp, you're still there with your table, and this is a camp supporting um, the warriors who are fighting the fish farm, so they'd love to talk to you too. So spend some time over there if you have time. You can also see some of the art around here. Um, Bill Horn and Claire Kunjuk um, have uh, arranged it. I don't know if it's all theirs, but they can say more. I just want to acknowledge it and, and ask you to appreciate it. Um, and I want to um, say that if any of you do have announcements or things that I'm missing, come up and, and tell me and I'll make sure I put them on the list. And we're going to break for 20 minutes only. Uh, there's the snacks are out there. And when you come back at 3.50, we're going to look at the long-term impact. Thank you. Thank you.